All right. So it's a few minutes after the hour and it looks like it's slowing down with everyone coming in. So I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Jamie Blatter and I use she, her pronouns. I currently live on We Out Lands in Northern California, which is today known as McKinleyville. And I'm the North Coast Specialist and Climate Specialist, as well as the Tribal Liaison for the Marine Protected Area Collaborative Network. And today we're hosting this webinar with a few partners, including the California Ocean Science Trust, the California Ocean Protection Council, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And climate change is obviously on all of our minds. And so we're just really grateful to have the opportunity to hear from some of California's experts. And I do want to note right off the bat that this discussion is not meant to represent all of the different perspectives and all of the decision makers and knowledge holders. And it's really just more of an informational opportunity to learn about a specific report that was released and to speak with some of the authors and contributors. But it's not meant to replace necessary dialogue with others who are really impacted by and hold a lot of answers to the climate crisis we face today, which includes California's tribal nations and indigenous peoples. And so a little later in the introduction, I'll provide information about additional ways to stay engaged and hear from more voices uh, by joining some of our upcoming community events. Next slide, please. Okay, so in just a moment, we're gonna do a short welcome poll, but first I wanna do a little housekeeping. Uh, so I will note that this is being recorded and it's going to be shared out um, on our website as well as in a follow-up email. So there will be other opportunities to watch if you miss anything. And the chat is going to be mostly disabled um, throughout the event for participants. You can um, chat to the panelists. So if you have any technical issues, uh, feel free to send um, chats and we can try to help you. Uh, the way that you can participate is by uh, the question and answer feature that's down at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to put in questions uh, into the Q&A box throughout the meeting as they arise. And then at the end of the session, we will have a Q&A panel and we'll get to as many as we can. So I will note that when you put a question into the Q&A, it doesn't appear to the whole group um, unless it's been answered. And so if you don't see the question that you submitted uh, being broadcasted to everyone, that, that's why. Um, and you can also use the Q&A to ask for support if you're having technical difficulties as well as the chat. In, I will say if you have general comments or opinions that you wish to share, we're going to ask that you hold them. We do have a whole bunch of upcoming community events where there's going to be a lot of time for more in-depth and two-way discussions. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're just going to launch a brief poll to just get a feel for who's in the room. So we'll launch it now and we'll just give about 90 seconds or so for you all to answer and then we'll share the results. So you should be see three questions up on your screen. Just give about 30 more seconds to answer the three short questions. All right, so we're gonna wrap it up. So we'll end the poll here, Nicole, and then if you're able to share it out so we can all see. 
All right. Awesome. So you should be able to scroll through on your screens to just kind of get a feel of who's here from the different regions, what types of affiliations we have present, and then everyone's favorite California NPA habitat. Looks like Intertidal is the winner. <laughs> <laughs> Not a surprise. All right, awesome. We can go ahead and put that away for now. Thanks for participating. Okay, and we can go to the next slide. All right, so we'll get started with the agenda. And first, I'm going to give an overview of the MPA Collaborative Network and our climate initiative, of which this webinar is a part. And then I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dom Kone from Ocean Science Trust to go over some key findings from the Climate Resilience in California's MPA Network report. And then we're gonna hear from Katie Sieri at the Ocean Protection Council about the four projects that they've recently um, awarded that have funding for the study of climate and MPAs. And then we'll have Chris Free and Timothy Frawley, who are PIs for two of these research projects that Katie's gonna be reviewing. And they're gonna share a little more in depth about the specific projects that they're working on. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up with the Q&A panel, which will have representatives from California Ocean Protection Council, California Ocean Science Trust, and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then we'll wrap up. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the MPA Collaborative Network. So we are an organization with the mission of empowering diverse communities to engage in marine protected area stewardship for a healthy ocean. And we have 14 chapters that we call collaboratives. Uh, they're roughly divided by each of California's coastal counties, although you do not need to reside in a coastal county to be a member. And the collaboratives bring together you know, all these affiliations that you were just seeing in the poll, which is government agencies, community members, tribal representatives, members and indigenous peoples, fishing representatives, NGOs, science and academia, ocean business, and others to collectively steward marine protected areas and advance shared priorities. And we also do a lot of information sharing uh, to advance the priorities of our members, which is a big part of why we organize this webinar and are launching our climate initiative because we've just been hearing from our membership how important it is uh, to make those connections between climate and MPAs. And so we have over 1500 members with, that come from over 450 distinct affiliations. And we call our model a top-down meets bottom-up approach. And so we really encourage you to join your local collaborative if you haven't already. And my team members are sharing the information in the chat where you can find more about your local collaborative. All right, so we are currently in the heart of a three-year climate initiative which we hope will continue well beyond three years. And the kickoff includes both a survey as well as this webinar. And the survey was actually just launched this morning. So you have a exclusive once in a lifetime opportunity to be among the very first respondents. And so the survey will take about five to 10 minutes and is aimed to explore localized concerns and needs related to climate change in the coast, as well as ideas for solutions. And so that will also be shared with you now and after this webinar. Uh, and we encourage you to participate when you have the opportunity. And then next on this timeline, you'll see the webinar, which we are at this very moment. Uh, we are on the webinar. And this will be followed by community climate forums for each of the 14 collaboratives, which will be a space to really dive deeper into the two-way sharing, to hear about your local concerns, your priorities, your perspectives, uh, your ideas for solutions, and like what you see as the biggest needs along your coastlines. 
and they will serve pretty much as listening sessions uh, and they'll complement the surveys. So after the forums and the surveys are completed, we will be analyzing the results of both and we'll be creating reports that can be shared with partners and decision makers to help inform them of all of the information and perspectives that we've gained. So, you know, also based on these results, the collaborative network uh, has funding to do some small projects to address things that are arising during the survey and forums. So it's really aimed at addressing the gap that was identified in the report that we're about to hear about uh, that says there's a need for deepened understanding of the human dimensions of California's MPAs and climate change. So the goal of all of this, in addition to sharing information, is to just elevate your voices to decision makers who are asking for this information and can take direct action. And then lastly, on the timeline, you'll see that we're gonna wrap up in 2025 with a statewide forum that's gonna bring everyone back together to share with one another and, and look forward towards the future. Next slide. All right, so I just wanted to briefly put up the dates of the forums, but you don't need to memorize this. It's all gonna be shared with you. It's being put in the chat and we'll have a follow-up email probably within the next week or so that's gonna have all of this information. But this will just kind of give you an idea of when your local forum is gonna be coming up and there will be links so that you can go ahead and register to join us. Okay, so that is it for me for now. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dom from the California Ocean Science Trust to go over some of the key takeaways from the Climate Resilience and California's MPA Network report that was released in uh, June of 2021. So take it away, Dom. Thanks so much, Jamie, and, and thanks for having me. I'm super excited to get to talk about such cool science that's included in, in this report. Um, go next slide. Um, so, for those who haven't met me before, I'm Dom Kone. I'm a senior science officer with the California Ocean Science Trust. And so this report that I'm going to be talking about today was produced in, in collaboration with OPC and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as a team of scientists that we'll call the, the working group that is intended to assess what our current understanding and evidence of MPA is potentially providing um, some climate resilience benefit to California marine ecosystems. Uh, and before I jump into the, the content, if you haven't worked with Ocean Science Trust before, or if you're unaware of, of who we are, um, we are a science nonprofit that brings together scientific experts and, and scientific expertise from across the state to inform state policy decision making. And so we work across a variety of different types of, of topics with this report and this issue just being one of the several issues that, that we work on. So I will do my best to, to communicate all of the great um, recommendations coming out of the, the working group. Uh, next slide. So obviously this story is going to sound familiar to uh, everyone here, but some of our, our, our most intense and severe climate events are on record are happening with increased frequency and intensity across the, the California current ecosystem. Um, and a lot of those stressors include things like marine heat wave, I mean waves, uh, low oxygen, changing ocean chemistry and, and rising seas. And a lot of the, the marine ecosystems, including the ones within MPAs, are facing a, a lot of change and, and essentially putting at risk a lot of the ecosystem services that, that we rely on, including fisheries, public health, tourism, and, and coastal protection. And one of the more recent examples I know is on top of everyone's mind is the 2014 to 2016 marine heat wave where we saw on the North Coast essentially led to, to widespread outbreaks in, in purple urchin barrens, uh, as well as kelp forest collapse across most of the, the North Coast. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, in recent years, there's been a lot of interest in, in essentially understanding the role that MPAs might play in providing both resilience and resistance to a lot of these climate stressors or climate-driven impacts. And we know from the literature that MPAs provide a lot of protective benefits to marine ecosystems, like larger populations, larger individuals, uh, older individuals, increased productivity, but they also provide this really exciting and promising opportunity to buffer and protect these ecosystems from climate impacts using those same protective benefits. Next slide. So before we go on any further with the, the presentation, I wanted to provide the working group's definition of what they mean by, by resilience. And the working group used this definition to get all on the same page with what we mean by when we say resilience, because sometimes resilience can in some cases be um, meant or swapped out for, for adaptation or different features of, of adaptation. And I know in the literature, that resilience is defined in so many different ways, depending on the topic or the area um, that you are considering um, investigating that, that topic in. So the working group developed this definition and they define resilience by the ability of a coupled social, ecological, and economic system and its components to absorb stressors and disturbance through resistance and recovery of core function, structure, and provision of services. So based off of this definition, we see that this concept of resilience really focuses both on being able to deal with a stressor and deal with a disturbance first, but then responding in such a way where we either stay or return to some pre-existing state or, or condition. Next slide. And as I was saying, uh, there is a lot of evidence to show that MPAs provide a suite of benefits to, to marine ecosystems. And a lot of those benefits are really important for helping these ecosystems be more resistant and also recover from disturbances. But now it's being hypothesized that a lot of those same benefits from the protection may also contribute to, to climate resilience. And what I'm showing here is a figure from a, a Robert et al. paper where they highlight eight different potential pathways by which MPAs may provide resilience to, to climate change. And those things range from reduction of, of human stress, but also providing unfished stepping stones for climate migrants or species that might be shifting their ranges, uh, as well as protecting population structure or, or ecosystem function. And while a lot of these hypotheses are exciting, there really is currently a lack of scientific evidence, particularly in California, to demonstrate that a lot of these resilience mechanisms are occurring. And that was the main motivation for, for this effort with OPC and, and CDFW. Next slide. So beginning in 2019, we convened a scientific working group to basically investigate this topic for, for California. And so we essentially worked with this team of scientists who had a range of expertise. So that included uh, ecologists, population biologists, oceanographers, and also importantly, social scientists, so that they could provide the scientific guidance and advice behind this issue. And then separately, we also worked alongside a policy advisory committee who helped ensure that a lot of the scientific guidance coming from the working group was aligned and relevant to the various policy needs, their questions, and general policy management priorities of MPAs here in the state of California. Next slide. So we covered the, the definition of resilience that the working group had developed, but we also had them work on a couple other things to really um, build up the, the content of this report. And the first one was summarizing our current scientific understanding of the MPA network's function through a climate change lens. So based on the evidence, are MPAs within California and outside California providing those climate resilience benefits? Secondly, based off of that current understanding, we had them identify research and science needs to better address how MPAs may perform in the face of climate change. And then lastly, to develop recommendations for how California's MPA network can be leverage as a climate resilient tool going forward, primarily through a science and monitoring lens. Next slide. So 
The first thing that the work group did was that they conducted a broad literature review of all the potential ways in which MPAs might provide climate resilience, both within and, and outside of California. And we organized each of those mechanisms and benefits into these five categories that I'm showing here on, on this slide. And across each of these categories, we asked the central question of what are the general benefits from protection that MPAs are providing to these marine ecosystems first? And then how might those benefits lead to climate resilience? So really getting at the mechanism at which the benefit is leading to the system being more resistant or being better able to recover from a climate disturbance. And so for each of these benefits and mechanism pairs, we determined what evidence there was to support the mechanism itself. And if not, identifying what the research need of knowledge gap might be so that we could acquire that knowledge. Next slide. So in total, we identified 22 of these individual pairs of the MPA protective benefit and the climate resilience uh, mechanism across all of the categories. I'm only showing you here a handful of examples to give you a sense of, of what we mean by an MPA benefit and a climate resilience mechanism. So for example, if we look at our reduction of environmental uh, stress line, we see a good example is that we know that MPAs can increase the extent and coverage of habitat or biomass of habitat. And through the increased provisioning of habitat, that can lead to better buffering of storms or even help the ecosystem be more resi resilient to changing ocean chemistry. Another good example might be that we know that MPAs increase the body size of, of individuals, and that could lead to increased tolerance to climate stress. So again, I want to note that um, it's important to note that a lot of these mechanisms are just proposed hypotheses for how these benefits could lead to a climate resilience mechanism. Um, and so the working group went through and assessed what was the existing evidence for each of these individual pairs of benefits and, and mechanisms. Next slide. So from their search, they found that there was in fact um, moderate to strong scientific evidence that shows that MPAs do provide a range of these protective benefits. And that's especially for larger populations with older and larger individuals. And each of these qualities individually, not considering climate, has been shown to lead to populations that are less likely to collapse from any type of, of disturbance. However, other than, the hand, other than a handful of studies, we found that there was relatively far less evidence demonstrating that the specific MPA mechanism was actually occurring from those MPA benefits. And this was especially true from the human dimension space where we're not only lacking the climate resilience evidence, but in many cases, we don't even have the scientific evidence to show the full range of MPA benefits that are focused on human dimensions. Um, and I do want to flag here one important message is that um, it's not that MPAs are not providing some type of climate resilience benefit. They very well may currently be doing that, but we currently don't have the scientific evidence to show that just yet, just based off of how previous studies have been designed or we haven't been using our available data in a way to really answer that question. So just wanted to provide a little bit of hope and not send the message that MPAs are definitely not conferring climate resilience because we don't know that just yet. Uh, next slide. So even though I mentioned that we do have a lack of evidence showing these climate resilience mechanisms, I did want to provide uh, some examples where we do have some of that, that evidence. And one example is actually directly from California, from the Northern Channel Islands, where in this system, predatory sea stars help to control purple urchin populations via predation. But following sea star wasting disease, which occurred across the entire US contiguous West Coast, which was also exacerbated by climate, that area saw a reduction in sea stars. And so in areas outside of MPAs, where a lot of these other predatory species like sheephead or lobsters, where they are fished, we actually found that there was an increase in, in urchins and decline in kelp once those urchins had fewer predators controlling their numbers. However, within MPAs, those other predatory species 
were protected and their numbers remained high enough so that they could control the urchin populations even in the absence of predatory sea stars. And so this study found that even after climate-related disturbance with sea star wasting disease, marine ecosystems within MPAs remained resistant to that change from kelp forest to, to urchin barrens. Next slide. The other example comes from Baja, California, where one study area com uh, compared abalones within and outside of marine reserves and found that abalones were larger and in greater densities than um, within reserves and outside reserves. But in 2009, that area experienced a hypoxic event where they saw a 75% reduction in abalone biomass outside of reserves, but only a 50% reduction within those reserve reserves. They also found that juvenile recruitment within reserves remained somewhat stable while outside reserves experienced a greater decline. So this is another great example where in this case, larger body size and higher densities within res reserves actually allowed abalones to better, better withstand this hypoxic event compared to abalone densities and populations outside of the reserves. Next slide. So based off of that literature uh, review, the working group identified 15 priority research questions to fill a lot of these knowledge gaps and advance this topic of whether or not California MPAs could provide a climate resilience to marine ecosystems. Uh, I won't go through every single question, but rather what I've done is that I am going to provide general themes to provide you with a quicker and more comprehensive understanding of some of these, these key knowledge gaps. So the first really crucial knowledge gap um, is exposure to climate. And this is a, a really important ingredient because one of the limiting factors with a lot of existing studies is that they do not show a link between the exposure from a climate stressor with the MPA benefit and then how that's linked to a climate resilience mechanism. So a very first ingredient in a lot of future research efforts is going to be looking at the spatial distribution of those climate stressors, as well as how those climate stressors may change over time and relating those to the spatial distribution of MPAs to see if we have that exposure and overlap. Second is ecological and genetic diversity. We really need to understand whether MPAs might facilitate species adaptive responses to climate change, and that can be via uh, genetic diversity. But then we also need to understand whether or not MPAs might be providing ecological diversity through increased functional diversity or redundancy, like we saw in the Northern Channel Islands um, example, also in response to, to climate stressors. The third bucket is societal needs and values. So this is really getting at that big knowledge gap of our lack of understanding and, and human dimensions. And right now we are very much lacking, not only in terms of, and we're lacking not only in what people value um, in these areas that are within MPAs or next to MPAs, but also what are the ecosystem services that they rely on and how might those values and services change over time under a future, um, under a future, under future climate change. And then the last bucket is MPA network effect. So we really need to understand whether California's MPAs will continue to protect key species as they, they migrate, but then also how climate change might affect ecosystem connectivity across the entire MPA network. And one really important recommendation to really bring in all these knowledge gaps together is to develop and implement a climate change research and monitoring plan for California's MPA network so we can continue to address these knowledge gaps in a very strategic and methodical fashion. Uh, next slide. All right, so I will wrap up quickly here so you see I'm over time. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate some of the key messages that were coming out of this, this presentation. And the first one is that, yes, we did confirm that there is evidence in the literature to show that there are a range of benefits for MPAs for marine ecosystems from those protective services but there is a lack of scientific evidence to really show the climate resilience mechanism. But this doesn't necessarily mean at this point in time that MPAs aren't providing some climate resilience benefit, just that we don't have the evidence to show that based off of the design of previous studies and how we have been using our available data to date. 
Having said that, I do think there's a really promising opportunity for California to lead the charge in this area because we have a lot of monitoring programs within MPAs where a lot of that research and data is becoming of age and becoming available to be used in these types of, of analyses. And lastly, to support a, a climate resilient MPA network in California and to um, continue to address this issue, it really would, would be beneficial to develop a research and monitoring plan so we can address this in the most strategic fashion as possible. Next slide, and I believe that's the last one. All right, thank you so much. Looking forward to questions at the end. Awesome, thank you, Dom. And just a reminder that you can, we have a couple questions coming in and feel free to just put them in as they come to mind and we'll start to collect them for a little later. So um, we, I did want to say that we uh, created a two page summary that has a few key highlights from the larger document. It shares a lot of the same diagrams that Dom just went over. And so it's really good for sharing and outreach of some of these key points. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Katie. You know, now that we have an overview of some of the connections and the gaps, we thought it'd be helpful to share information about specific actions being taken to fill those gaps and move this work forward. So Katie's gonna go over some projects that the Ocean Protection Council has recently funded to help study these connections a little deeper. Thank you, Jamie, um, for that introduction. So yeah, my name is Katie Sierra, um, and I'm a Sea Grant Fellow with the Biodiversity Program at the Ocean Protection Council. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, OPC is a cabinet level state body that works jointly with state and federal agencies NGOs and the public to ensure that California maintains healthy, resilient, and productive ocean and coastal ecosystems. Um, and as an OPC staff member, I help to um, inform the council on those decisions. Um, so Dom gave a really excellent background on this climate resilience report. Um, so based on recommendations from that report, um, in July 2022, OPC launched a competitive solicitation for project proposals that aim to understand the role that California's MPA network plays in the face of climate change, climate vulnerability, and marine heat waves in the lives of key species, habitats, or human activities. So really, we were seeking to fill those knowledge gaps which Dom presented. Um, so we really prioritized three types of projects for funding. Um, first off, those that characterize, excuse me, local vulnerability of MPAs across multiple stressors to evaluate the potential of the MPA network to provide ecological resilience through climate refugia. We also prioritize projects that modeled habitat and species distributions in current and future conditions to inform risk assessments of species, ecosystems, and habitats within MPAs. And we also assessed social values and outcomes relating to MPAs and climate resilience in California. So based on that competitive call, um, we wound up funding four projects, um, and so those were selected for funding in January 2023 from a total funding allocation of $2.4 million. Um, so you can see the projects outlined here, and I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, so Dr. Will White at Oregon State University was funded for management strategy evaluations for MPA management. Um, Dr. Jen Cassell at UC Santa Barbara was funded for MPA rain shifts and fishing vulnerability. Um, and Chris Free will be speaking to that project today. Um, we also funded Dr. Tim Frawley for MPA and social values under claim cha changing climates. And we're also gonna hear from Tim today a little bit later. Um, and then finally, we funded MPA and surf, surf zone and climate resilience um, from Dr. Jenny Dugan at UC Santa Barbara. Um, so now I'm going to take a deeper dive into some of those projects that aren't present today. So if I get the next slide, please. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this one project we funded, Climate Resilience in California's MPA Network, Management Options and Opportunities. Um, so this project will use management strategy evaluations to evaluate the successes of different management and restoration options to increase, increase the climate resilience of California's MPA network, as well as ecosystems and fisheries outside of MPAs. Um, so this project will include workshops with CDFW staff and the MSLT to discuss, discuss adaptive management. We'll also include public webinars to showcase workshop results and web-based tools. We'll also include manipulative lab experiments to generate empirical estimates of urchin responses to climate stressors. And some of the tools that will come out of this project will be climate 
projected models of habitat suitability, generalized and California specific management strategy evaluations, and larval connectivity simulations. Um, and the results of the study will be hosted on a web-based tool that community members and partners will have the opportunity to be trained on to ensure equity in accessing these tools. Next slide, please. Okay, so then this project targeting um, projecting habitat and indicator species distributions for beach and surf zone ecosystems in current and future conditions within California's MPA network. Um, so this project will deliver distribution distributional maps of species ranges and habitats, technical reports, and new educational material on the themes of MPAs, sandy beach, and surf zone ecosystems, and their projected responses to climate change. Deliverables will also be made public via the OPC website. Um, so habitat and climate maps for sandy beaches and MPA network under current and future climate conditions will be delivered as part of this project. We will also get species distribution maps for indicator taxa and species within the MPA network under current and future climate scenarios. Um, notably, this project will use data from the community science group Grunion Greeters to develop these models. Um, this will, project will also include meetings, interviews, and surveys with stakeholders. Um, and we'll also produce curriculum materials for K through 12 and public education. Um, so these projects are ongoing. Um, we're expecting results from this project in summer 2025. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris, followed by Timothy. So. Katie give an overview and then Chris and Timothy are each going to go into projects that they're working on to dive a little deeper. All right, thanks so much. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Chris Free. I'm research faculty at uh, UC Santa Barbara and I'm presenting today on uh, behalf of my two other colleagues who were funded as part of this project, Jean Cassell and Anita uh, Gerardo uh, Spina, and they are both scuba diving in Palmyra right now in the tropical Pacific. So as amazing as this webinar is, I think I might have uh, drawn the short the short straw. Um, but um, our project is really um, focused on trying to understand um, how uh, climate change is going to shift the distribution of uh, California's marine fish species and how we can adapt MPA management and also uh, traditional fisheries management to be responsible to the uh, responsive to those um, projected distribution shifts. Um, so next slide. Um, so uh, climate change, one of the, the sort of uh, uh, sort of biggest symptoms of, of climate change impacts on uh, marine ecosystems is going to be the redistribution of uh, where uh, marine species live out in the ocean. Um, uh, so climate change is going to change oceanographic conditions, and we expect uh, species to shift where they live to track their uh, preferred preferred distribution. So this little, so the schematic is illustrating that uh, process where um, the deep yellow colors represent like the highest abundance of uh, an example marine species and how that it varies over time in, in response to climate change. Um, and uh, these climate driven distribution shifts, we expect will change a couple of different um, factors that will act together synergistically. Uh, one is as species redistribute, they might change um, their levels of MPA protection, the sort of proportion of their population that is either protected or not protected inside MPAs. It's also going to redistribute um, uh, fishing grounds targeted by fishermen, and fishermen might need to uh, travel farther to um, um, access their uh, traditional resources or um, uh, might have to sort of exploit sort of novel territories that they're uh, less familiar with. Um, and, and these two changes could also interact where the amount of fishing grounds that are uh, sort of protected, protected inside MPAs um, um, uh, could change uh, under, under climate change. Um, so we want to sort of uh, examine uh, the magnitudes and patterns in these different phenomena and provide some recommendations about how to adjust MPA and uh, traditional fisheries management in response to these changes. Um, next slide. So um, this, I'm just going to go sort of over the objectives and the ultimate sort of implications of, of our work. Um, but our very first step is going to try to develop uh, species distribution models for a lot of the nearshore species that haven't had um, species distribution models developed for them in the past. 
And these will um, provide us with a tool for um, 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 forecasting how we expect climate change to impact the redistribution of, of these marine species. Um, and then we can examine changes. This will allow us to examine changes in uh, communities protected inside of MPAs. And it will also allow us to see uh, changes in the level of MPA protection afforded to each of these individual species. Um, then on the fisheries side of things, it's going to allow us to um, uh, forecast how shifts um, in fishing grounds uh, we can expect under climate change and how this might lead to um, um, either greater or even lesser um, uh, levels of MPA protection. Um, next slide. Perfect. Um, and, and so we're sort of expecting that there could be sort of two um, sort of archetypes of, of impacts um, and, and that there might be uh, different sort of management strategies taken in response to those impacts. So for species that are gaining MPA protection under climate change, um, uh, because they're, they're gaining protection, that might leave some room to sort of relax traditional fisheries management to compensate for that uh, um, increased levels of protection. And this can be especially important for uh, vulnerable fishing communities whose uh, you know, fishing grounds are being most impacted by climate change. And then for species that are losing MPA, levels of MPA protection under climate change, um, those might be species where we might need to look to strengthen traditional fisheries management to compensate for those lost levels of protection. Um, or they could even be used to help target um, sort of strategic areas to uh, expand the MPA network to uh, maintain levels of protection for that species. Next slide. Um, and, and one of our key deliverables for this is going to be to, de to develop a um, interactive web application uh, that will allow um, uh, you, decision makers, um, any other me uh, members of the public to sort of explore these results um, and see how um, for, uh, you know, any selected species, how we project uh, their distribution to shift under climate change and to see um, how the uh, uh, level of protection with MPAs might change. And also to explore those results by, um, by uh, fishing communities, which we might define based on um, ports and permit types and see how uh, the fishing grounds associated with those ports and permit types um, are expected to change through time and how um, levels of MPA protection um, are expected to, to interact. Um, so uh, that's that's a brief overview of, um, of our work and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about it and uh, question and answer later. Great, thank you, Chris. Keep adding your questions into the Q&A. We're compiling them and we'll get to the panel after we hear from Timothy. Hi. Um, when you're studying uh, climate resilience of MPAs or really anything else for that matter, oftentimes a good place to start is by asking resilience of what and uh, resilience for whom. There's frequently trade-offs uh, between strategies that function to enhance the resilience of one region, uh, group, or scale organization at the expense of others, increasing their vulnerability and risk. Uh, likewise, as Dom alluded to at the top of the presentation, resilience means different things according to different people, according to their lived experience and disciplinary background. Uh, if we're considering social resilience in addition to ecological resilience, it's worth thinking critically about um, whether or not preserving the current systems and structures is a desirable target if they function to benefit some groups at the expense of others. Um, so yeah, in this project, um, we're taking kind of a different lens, uh, working with a, a bunch of social scientists. Um, there's been a, done, a bunch of work um, concerning the capacity of MPAs to protect certain species or ecological communities and the commercial and recreational fishers uh, that depend on them. But um, we're kind of hoping to expand um, the net in this project um, and consider how MPAs serve a diversity of user groups and demographics across the California coast. More specifically, um, we're really focusing in on disadvantaged and severely disadvantaged communities as defined by the U.S. Census and tribal communities and exploring how MPAs or other spatial management strategies could be uh, used to help address their needs and priorities as environmental and socioeconomic change progresses. Uh, critically, for many of the groups that we're working with, issues surrounding equity and ocean access are often just as important 
um, as potential changes in ecological indicators like species of abundance of distribution or biodiversity. Um, so these specific objectives, um, we're going to try and address some of those social values, knowledge, knowledge gaps that were articulate, uh, articulated early on surrounding um, activities, values, and cultures associated with the different coastal species and habitats. We want to evaluate the capacity of MPAs to support and enhance these uses um, under the face of climate change. We want to train student researchers um, from underrepresented backgrounds um, as future ocean ambassadors, hoping that they can um, engage with communities that are typically um, not, not part of this discourse normally. And then we want to co-develop management and outreach, outreach strategies required to center the needs of, uh, of the underserved and climate adaptation planning. Next slide. Uh, so how are we going to do all this? Um, yeah, so it's a it, it's a different set of tools than has been traditionally applied to um, the MPA um, kind of discussion. We're gonna do interviews where the first step is just um, go out and talk to as many people as we can from these communities in Central and Southern California. Um, while we can't talk to anyone, everyone, we can uh, also use other tools um, like social media to see like um, what people are talking about, what their values are. Um, Kind of what the issues of concern are for them. All this uh, work is going to funnel into a cross-cultural comparative survey that we're going to do uh, next summer. Um, we're going to follow that up with focus group discussions where we present the survey results back to the communities um, that, that did the surveys and ask them for their help and um, in analyzing and interpreting the data. And then there's um, going to be a biocultural vulnerability analysis where we're hoping to add a social access to the axes of sensitivity and exposure that have traditionally been used to evaluate um, climate risks associated with certain species. Um, yeah, so big group of academic partners, um, but I think even more exciting than that is um, these community partners that we're working with um, where collaborating with um, environmental justice organizations uh, across Central and Southern California that already have their boots on the ground in these communities and hoping to uh, leverage their insight, experience, and relationships to kind of, um, yeah, get at some of these information gaps that, um, that we know we need to address, but we're not quite sure how. And if, yeah, if you want to follow this project as it develops, uh, definitely check out um, and keep tabs on our website. Uh, well, there's like introductory material there, and then we're going to be posting blogs regularly from the students working on the project as, as things progress. And uh, I look forward to answering any of your questions in the Q&A. All right. Thank you so much to all of you. We have about 10 minutes, just a little under, to answer a few of the questions that have been coming in. And so I just wanted to highlight that uh, addition, in addition to everyone that you've heard from already, we will also have Steve Wirtz from the Department of Fish and Wildlife joining to answer any questions. So keep putting your questions in and I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So one of the questions that we had is about what is the best way to ensure that California's marine protected areas uh, are climate ready? And, you know, for example, are there specific things such as stronger protections of MPAs or more MPAs or more regular adaptive management reviews, more protection of certain ecosystems, or is it kind of at that phase that it's too soon to say? Um, and so maybe, Dom, I don't know if you can share if there's any, any of the recommendations in the reports have those specific or if the recommendations at this point are more about what data gaps need to be filled in order to even make recommendations such as that. Yeah, I think certainly the latter. I think that we're at the point of, um, unfortunately, just, just not knowing or being able to to show evidence that MPAs are providing the suite of, of um, climate resilience benefits that, that we'd like to see. But as I was saying, it that doesn't mean that they aren't necessarily currently doing that is just that we haven't set up um, our previous scientific projects in a way to analyze the data to conclusively say if those common resilience benefits are, are happening. Um, 
So I think that there's a, a lot of promise and a lot of opportunities going forward with the wealth of, of data that we're getting from a lot of our statewide monitoring programs and, and projects to, to use that in a way to figure out if we if the MPAs are providing currently or might in the future provide those climate resilience benefits. So it's just a more of a matter of strategically um, including those data sets in a way to, to answer that question. Great, thank you. And, and continuing on that, you know, I think that a lot of people are feeling a sense of urgency. And so this question would be for most likely Steve with the uh, Fish and Wildlife, but anyone else is also welcome to chime in of how do you see uh, adaptive management taking place? And are at this point, are we kind of waiting on the studies that are undertaking right now? Or are there certain things that the department already has in mind for how to maybe start integrating and in taking adaptive management actions? Great, that, that's a great question, thanks. Um, well, the department is using the best available information and, and uh, expert opinion to inform adaptive management of the network. And we we're fortunate in this program to have a history of baseline monitoring and long-term monitoring, which helped inform the first decadal management review. And that was supported by documents that Dom talked about and, Katie at OPC, they formed a decadal evaluation group that de developed some tractable scientific questions. And so all of that information, in addition to other sources, is helped the department develop prioritized questions for moving forward. And as Dom just mentioned a few moments ago, the studies in the past had not specifically been set up for climate change. You know, when the network was, the law for the network went into place was over two decades ago. And it was set up to protect uh, biodiversity and the habitats for which they depend upon. And, uh, and you know, natural fluctuations in the environment, but this massive heat wave like we had in 2014 to 16 across Eastern Pacific along North America, um, there was really no shelter for anybody that was living in the ocean. So, um, all, new information coming in, these exciting studies by Chris and Timothy will help inform moving forward. So I guess in a nutshell, we need more information before any changes can be made. But in our um, recommendations for the next 10 years, climate change is a high priority. And the human aspect of that is also a top priority for the department. And we can paste the link of those recommendations in the chat for the group. But it's, um, you know, globally, I think we heard also that there's just no way to tell quite yet how much MPAs are, you know, benefiting the resources that they were designed for. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. One quick question for Dom that came in. Were there any community scientists involved in your working group? Yeah, no. Um... No community scientists in particular, but we did include um, social scientists that have worked on on MPAs in in the past, and so they were really pivotal in helping us sift through the the literature and really understand where the holes were in our understanding of not only the potential um, benefits of MPAs to coastal communities, but whether or not those were leading to potentially uh, resilience mechanisms and, and climate resilience benefits. I am seeing a few questions about accessing documents. So uh, just rest assured that we will get you all of that information. But in terms of generally keeping everyone keeping up to date, we'll just kind of close with a question for everyone. If you can all give a quick overview of how people can stay up to date with what you're doing. And we can go ahead and uh, start with Katie at OPC. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to stay up with to date with us is, you know, check our website. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, all social media. So feel free to follow us and that'll keep you abreast of these um, ongoing situations. And we expect um, results from these reports to be published around summer 2025. Okay, perfect. And that ties in. So for Timothy and Chris, would that be the same that people should just kind of keep an eye out for those reports to come out in summer of 2025? And I'm seeing Chris shake, uh, nodding his head. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I would say also uh, check out that website that um, I shared and um, there's links to uh, a couple of social media accounts that were just kind of getting spun up. So we hope we hope to have like ongoing, um, I guess, dispatches as we're working through stuff in addition to kind of that final summary document. All right. And then, Dom, this also ties into one other question about in the chat about if the document is being updated. So is there a way to say kind of updated on anything that OST is doing in this realm? Yeah, absolutely. So this this document won't be updated going forward. So 2021 is the conclusion of the working group's work. But OST is also involved in several other projects that are related to climate change in the, the coastal resilience insurance space, sea level rise, um, climate ready fisheries. And so we very regularly provide those results and reports via our, our monthly newsletter. Um, and so we come out with a new report with new findings on different topics every couple of months. Um, so you can join the, that new letter via our website. Awesome. And Steve, any particular place to send people from the department that are curious specifically about how climate ties into MPAs and what you're doing? Yeah, the same as Ocean Protection Council. Check out our webpage. Uh, we do uh, news releases, blogs, and also track the Fish and Game Commission when you have a chance to see the hot topics that they're discussing and you can have your voice heard at that at that venture. Um, so that, that's what I would recommend. Great. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. There were some questions that we didn't get to, but we're hoping that this can be a continual partnership and perhaps as the studies draw to a close, we might have another opportunity to share information about how they went, uh, as well as come to the forums that are coming up. They're gonna be two hours each. So there will be a lot of time to really just dive into specifics of what you're seeing locally, to talk to one another, to share your input. Uh, and please as well, uh, take the survey so we can share your input and your visions and your concerns with all of these decision makers that were here today uh, and beyond. And once again, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be sharing all these resources with you and we hope to see you soon at your local forums. Have a wonderful Thursday. Thanks guys. Thanks. Thanks so Thanks, much. Katie. Thanks Katie. Thanks, recording will be shared. Okay, great. Have a good one. All right. Yeah. Want to end it, Jamie? I guess so. Okay.